Thank you. We turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlow. Uh, those calling for the Prime Minister's deal to be supported included the National Farmers Union of Scotland, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Scotch Whisky Association, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation and the CBI. First Minister, are they traitors too? First Minister. Well, firstly, the Prime Minister's deal is a bad deal, a bad deal for the UK and certainly a bad deal for Scotland. Let me just recap. It would take Scotland out of the EU against our will, out of the single market, out of the customs union with no clarity about the future relationship with the EU. I don't think any uh, MP with the best interests of Scotland at heart should vote for that proposition. Um, but I would say gently to Jackson Carlaw, even if, even if every single SNP yeah. MP had voted for the deal earlier in the week, it would still have been heavily defeated yeah. because the Prime Minister failed uh, to persuade so many in her own side. Indeed, she's failing to persuade those in her own cabinet. Uh, but uh, Jackson Carlaw mentions the National Farmers Union. Uh, here's what they said uh, yesterday about the tariff schedule uh, that was published uh, by the UK government. They said that it undermines the food security of the UK. What an appalling uh, set of circumstances. And of course, they also uh, wrote to every Scottish MP uh, urging them to take no deal off the table. So perhaps Jackson Carlaw would like to explain to the Chamber and to the public today, why with just one exception, and I'm not talking about David Mundell, with one exception, none of the Scottish Tory MPs uh, voted last night in the House of Commons to take no deal off the table. That is what was utterly shameful, and perhaps Jackson Carlaw would care to explain it. Jackson Carlaw. Presiding officer, on Tuesday of this week, the SNP Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell, sitting just next to her, accused those who backed the Prime Minister's deal as being traitors to Scotland. As ever, he thought he was being clever. He hid the accusation behind a hashtag, but that's the charge he made. Surely the First Minister will disassociate herself from this inflammatory smear, and it's telling that she is not. But there is an important point here. There are many of us in Scotland, in politics and outside, who do back the Prime Minister's deal. Yeah. Will the First Minister at least accept that we think it is what's best for our country, and we do so in all good faith? First Minister. Do you know, I, I genuinely am struggling to believe that Jackson Carlaw is coming here to talk about a Twitter hashtag. Yes. Yeah. When... The government led by his party is in meltdown, is a shambles and is taking this country ever closer to the cliff edge. Uh, on the, the question of the historical Ragman's role, however, he might be interested to know uh, Robert the Bruce uh, actually signed it. If David Mundell ever wants to get any of the spirit of Robert the Bruce, then I'm sure all of us uh, would warmly welcome that. But the fact of the matter... The fact of the matter is, presiding officer, uh, with the exception of Paul Masterton, the honourable exception of Paul Masterton, every single Scottish Conservative MP has chosen to put loyalty to the Prime Minister ahead of the interests yep. of the Scottish people. Yep. I'm afraid that is a fact. Uh, and I'll give Jackson Carlaw another opportunity to explain why all of them refused, with one exception last night, to vote to take no deal off the table. Businesses like the one I was visiting in Glasgow yesterday, the Farmers Union, interest the length and breadth of the country. It wanted all Scotland's MPs to take no deal off the table. Why did Scottish Tories refuse to do that? Jackson Carlow. <laughs> Presiding officer, I'm asking her to enhance the dignity of her office. She's chosen not to do so. <laughs> Presiding officer, many joined the business organisations I mentioned in backing the deal earlier this week because we believe it is a good deal which offers certainty for business in the country. I respect the views of those who disagree, but they now have a duty to spell out their alternative way forward. The First Minister's preference is to support a second UK Brexit referendum, but it begs so many more questions. What would be the options? 
when leave or remain wins this time, shall we make it best of three? How would this delay guarantee people and businesses the certainty they need and which the, Prime, uh, the First Minister talked about last night? And would she accept the result? Yeah. Or is all of this, as many of us suspect, just a prelude to yet another referendum, the one she really wants? First Minister. Well, I think the result of the 2016 Brexit referendum in Scotland should have been accepted because Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. Can I remind him again, though, and this is where Jackson Carlaw, or one of the many areas where Jackson Carlaw is really struggling here, not surprisingly, given the mess the Tories are making, not just of Brexit, but of the entire UK uh, right now. If every single... SNP MP had voted for the Prime Minister's deal yeah. on Tuesday night, it would still have gone down to a heavy defeat because she has not managed to persuade those in her own party, let alone anyone else. And in terms of spelling out a way forward, I, I spent two years, more than two years, uh, suggesting compromise to the Prime Minister. Single market, yeah. customs union Absolutely. compromise, that was cast aside, ignored and dismissed as every vote in this Parliament on the issue has been cast aside, ignored and dismissed by the Tory government. But the way forward now, yes, is to put this issue back to the people. Parliament has failed to resolve this issue. And if Parliament can't decide, uh, the people should. So that's what yeah. I think is the way forward, and it's a better way forward uh, than the Prime Minister trying to bully the House of Commons into accepting a bad deal. She should accept defeat, change course, and open her mind now to the right way forward. Jackson Carlo. Not that this First Minister has ever sought to bully this Parliament when they've been defeated on issues. Yeah. But. We have accepted the result of all referendums. The First Minister has accepted the result of none. Yeah. The blunt truth is the First Minister will only accept the result of a referendum, anyone, if it goes her way. I back a deal that gives our fishing communities the sea of opportunity they want, a deal supported by our whisky industry, giving them frictionless trade across the continent, a deal that our farmers say will ensure there are no hard barriers to our biggest market. All these Scottish organisations, and many all across Scotland, are telling us to back the deal and get this done. Isn't it time to respect the result, back an orderly exit, Brexit? The whole country gets a chance then to move on. First Minister. I do respect the outcome of the 2016 referendum. Scotland voted to remain in the EU. That is the best outcome for Scotland. And if the Tories for once in their life could ever find it within themselves to stand up for Scotland rather than standing up for a beleaguered Prime Minister, yeah, then yes, they would also yeah, recognise yeah, it's the best uh, future for Scotland. Uh, frankly, it is deluded for anyone to suggest that there is majority support across Scotland for the Prime Minister's deal. Uh, there is not support for leaving the EU. There is certainly not support for leaving on the basis of such a profoundly bad deal. Uh, the Prime Minister's deal has been defeated overwhelmingly in the House of Commons, not just once, but twice. It is time for her to accept that defeat uh, and open her mind now to an alternative way forward. Let's get no deal properly off the table. Let's seek a lengthy extension yep. to allow this yep. issue to go back to the people. If the Conservatives were listening, not to their bosses in Westminster, but if they were listening to majority opinion across Scotland, that's exactly what the Conservatives would be arguing for. And I think it is to their great discredit that they are failing to do that, that they are indeed failing Scotland. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, last night the House of Commons voted to oppose a no deal Brexit. But as the law stands, we will still be leaving the European Union on the 29th of March with no deal. The First Minister and I agree that no deal would be a disaster. Two years of Theresa May claiming that no deal is better than a bad deal is nothing less than a lie. Does the First Minister agree with me that despite last night's vote, no deal remains an immediate and a very real danger? 
Uh, Be careful yes. with the language, uh, Richard Leonard. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Richard Leonard is right to point out uh, that notwithstanding the vote in the House of Commons last night, the legal default is no deal on the 29th of March, which is why I think uh, the government should be coming forward now with a proposition to change the law so that uh, the UK does not crash out of uh, the EU on the 29th of March uh, with no deal, and I hope he would uh, support that proposition. But I also think it's important for those uh, who oppose uh, the Prime Minister's deal, for those of us, uh, which I think includes Richard Leonard, who oppose uh, Brexit, to come together now to find a better way forward. And I say to him, uh, I hope in a constructive spirit, that, uh, and ask him if he can use his influence with Jeremy Corbyn to get Jeremy Corbyn uh, firmly behind uh, the option of a second EU referendum because if he would come off the fence then I think that option uh, would become not just the best one uh, but the most likely uh, next step. So will he uh, perhaps this afternoon get on the phone to Jeremy Corbyn and ask him to at long last on the issue of Brexit start showing some leadership? And Mr Leonard can I just ask you Mr Leonard, I can just ask you not to use the term lie, even about people outside, the, or particularly about people outside this chamber. Mr Leonard. Okay. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, can I just remind uh, the chamber that last week in this parliament, all parties voted to reject no deal in all circumstances, with the sole exception of the Tories. What does it say about the Tories in here that every single one of them, without exception, voted for something that neither the Secretary of State for Scotland nor Jackson Carlow's own MP could support last yeah, night. Absolutely. But the reality is this, without a majority in the Commons for an alternative, no deal remains a threat. So does the First Minister agree with me that tonight members of Parliament must vote for Article 50 to be extended long enough to allow for a majority in Parliament to be formed in favour of a different approach? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, and SNP MPs have been uh, laying amendments to that effect and uh, will vote for exactly that. In fact, I think it is time for the House of Commons to take uh, control of this out of the hands of the Prime Minister and the government uh, and to make sure that a sensible way forward is found. I agree wholeheartedly with Richard Leonard about the Scottish Conservatives. He's right to say this parliament voted uh, overwhelmingly to reject uh, no deal last week. And this parliament, again, is being ignored, not just by the, the government, but by Scottish Tory uh, MPs. I, I think it is to his credit that Paul Masterton did the right thing last night. The Secretary of State for Scotland, though, can't even manage to rebel properly. Uh, he <laughs> pathetically opted for an abstention to save his own job rather than properly standing up for this country. And that, I think, is a disgrace. Uh, but on the issue of the way forward, um, I say again to Richard Leonard, because I think we probably agree on more than we disagree on, on this issue, but Jeremy Corbyn uh, surely has to start showing real leadership here, because it is, even at this stage, not entirely clear to me what would be different about the situation the UK is in just now if Jeremy Corbyn uh, was leading the Brexit negotiations rather than Theresa May. Uh, the way to break the parliamentary deadlock is to put this issue back to the people. So I hope Richard Leonard uh, will seek to uh, persuade his leader that that is the option that should be backed and then we can build a majority around that and find a better, the right way forward, uh, not just for Scotland but for the whole of the UK. Richard Leonard. Well, Jeremy Corbyn's made it clear that the House of Commons has got two options. It's got the option of securing a better deal or taking it back to the people. That's the Labour Party position. We know, we know that the House of Commons does not want two things. It does not want no deal and it does not want Theresa May's deal. But the Prime Minister still isn't listening and she says that she wants to bring back her deal back for a third time, even though the deal is dead. Does the First Minister agree with me that the Prime Minister cannot keep asking the same question until she gets the answer that she wants? First Minister. Yes, I, I agree with that. You, one, one of the favourite catchphrases of the Tories is, uh, we said no and, and we mean it. Perhaps they should start applying it to uh, the Prime Minister and the government in London. Um, but I'd say to, to Richard Leonard about the two options he says the House of Commons has, uh, one of which, according to him, is a better deal. There is no good Brexit deal. 
A Labour Brexit will not be better or less damaging to Scotland than a Tory Brexit. It is Brexit that will do the damage to Scotland and that is why we should be seeking to honour honour the vote of the Scottish people and reverse uh, Brexit if we possibly can. So I hope uh, we will be able uh, to put a majority behind a second EU referendum so that people not just in Scotland but across uh, the UK knowing everything that is now known about Brexit can take that opportunity to keep the UK and to keep Scotland where it belongs which is within the European Union. Yeah. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Tavish Scott to be followed by Bob Doris. Presiding officer, the internationally recognised Fair Isle Bird Observatory was destroyed by fire last weekend. Uh, thankfully, no one was injured. Despite the valiant efforts of firefighters from across Shetland and the Fair Isle team led by Fiona Mitchell, the home that is David and Susanna Parnaby's uh, was completely destroyed. Uh, would the First Minister accept that uh, Fair Isle is the kind of island that gets on and wants to move forward and their intention is to rebuild the observatory and will her government please provide every assistance towards that? Will she also ensure that lessons are learnt from the Fair Isle fire for the emergency services in supporting fires in islands where there's no full-time fire cover. And finally, would you recognise that three out of the nine local firefighting team are French? Uh, these brave women are having to apply to stay in Fair Isle because of the omni shambles that is Brexit. First Minister. Well, on that last point, before I, I come on to the substantive issue, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with Tavish Scott. It is outrageous, in my view, that any EU national uh, who has made Scotland, any part of Scotland, their home is having to apply for the right to stay here. But the circumstances that he has outlined, I think, uh, underlines just how shameful uh, that situation is. Um, more generally, Presiding Officer, can I thank Tavish Scott for raising this issue and say that my thoughts are very much with all those connected with the Fair Isle Bird Observatory Trust at this very, very sad time, particularly uh, the warden's family, who, of course, sadly lost their home in the fire. As Tavish Scott said, uh, we must be thankful, of course, that there were no casualties. Uh, incidents like this remind us of the bravery and professionalism of our firefighters. I note Tavish Scott's point, and we will reflect on the point about uh, the island with no uh, full-time uh, fire uh, cover. Uh, but this was a good example of an effective multi-agency uh, response, and the Coast Guard, Shetland Isles Council, were both assisting uh, firefighters in reaching the scene. Obviously, investigations into the cause of the fire are underway, and we must await the outcome of those inquiries and thankfully the wealth of bird census data collected since 1948 are digitised and backed up uh, safely. Uh, lastly, presiding officer, I want to acknowledge the efforts of the Fair Isle community who I understand have raised uh, almost £20,000 in crowdfunding support for the warden's uh, family to help them get back on their feet. But let me uh, give an assurance to Tavish Scott uh, and to his constituents today that the Scottish Government stands ready to do anything we reasonably can to help uh, in this very tragic situation. Bob Doris to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Presiding officer, my constituents, the Dallas family, have had their appeal for asylum refused. I understand they fled to the UK in December 2017 after Mrs Dallas escaped a gun attack in Karachi, fueled by a fatwa against her because she simply could not agree <coughs> to convert from Christianity to Islam. It would appear that the Home Office may place an undue weight on local police reports in making such determinations. Does the First Minister share the concern of the European Centre for Law and Justice over police torture in Pakistan of Christians, something that makes victims nervous of reporting incidents such as in this case. And would the Scottish Government make representations to the UK Home Office asking for them to take into account such concerns when cases such as the Dallas family are being considered? First Minister. Well, I thank Bob Doris for raising this issue. Uh, firstly, yes, I do share the concern of the European Centre for Law and Justice. Uh, I strongly condemn, as I'm sure everybody in the Chamber does, any persecution of people from minority communities. Uh, nobody should ever feel at risk because of their faith or beliefs. Uh, the Scottish Government will always seek to champion human rights and we strongly support international processes such as UN scrutiny of individual member states. Of course, Sadly, asylum is a matter reserved to the UK government and handled by the Home Office, but the Scottish Government has consistently urged the Home Office to adopt fair and humane asylum policies and to ensure that full account is taken of all of the individual circumstances in every case, and we will continue to do that. And if there is any uh, assistance we can offer to uh, the Dallas family, uh, then we'd be happy to discuss that with Bob Doris. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Donald Cameron. Presiding Officer, I've been inundated this week with messages from constituents who are quite frankly disgusted, absolutely disgusted, at the images appearing on social media 
of a fox being ripped apart by the dogs of the Fife fox hunt last weekend. So can I ask the First Minister a very simple question? Should dogs ever be used to hunt a fox? First Minister. I can absolutely uh, understand the distress that people feel at the images that Mark Ruskell has uh, referred to. I, I share uh, that feeling. Um, as Mark Ruskell knows, uh, the government has announced proposals, uh, brought forward proposals following Lord Bonamy's uh, review for uh, further restrictions uh, around uh, fox hunting. And those proposals now, I think, will rightly be debated uh, by Parliament. And I know that Mark Ruskell uh, and others, uh, including many on my own benches here, who feel very, very strongly about this issue, uh, will make sure that they make their views known as uh, these proposals go through Parliament. I think that's now the right way for Parliament to proceed. And I look forward to the debates that will follow. Donald Cameron. Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the tragic loss of life on Ben Nevis earlier this week in one of the worst climbing accidents in recent history. Will the First Minister join me in expressing condolences to the family of those who died and also in paying tribute to the volunteers of Lochaber and Glencoe mountain rescue teams and the Coast Guard who worked so courageously in atrocious conditions to rescue the casualties? First Minister. Uh, can I... Uh... Thank Donald Cameron uh, for raising uh, this issue. Uh, I, of course, uh, join with him uh, in conveying my deepest condolences to the bereaved, uh, to uh, those uh, injured, uh, and also, of course, to uh, express my deep gratitude, uh, echoed, I'm sure, across the whole chamber, to our emergency services, to those in our mountain rescue teams, to the Coast Guard, uh, to all of those people who put their own lives on uh, the line trying to rescue people who get into trouble on our, our mountains. It's hard to uh, adequately express the depth of gratitude that I think all of us owe uh, to these people. Uh, this tragic event, and uh, it is a, a deeply tragic event, is uh, a reminder of uh, no matter uh, the joy and the beauty uh, of our mountains and our landscape, they can also be dangerous places, and uh, that has to be taken into account at all times. But for uh, now, my condolences go uh, particularly to the bereaved, and yes, my grateful thanks go uh, to all those who took part in the rescue. Thank you. Question number three, Willie Rennie. The SNP government passed a law that bans sending biodegradable waste to landfill by 2021. But according to an astonishing report by the Office of Budget Responsibility published yesterday, the Scottish Government has admitted that it can only meet this legal deadline by dumping the waste in England. Is this environmentally responsible? First Minister. I'm not sure I would agree with Willie Rennie's characterisation of this. We, I think, had an exchange, not him and I, him and uh, me and someone else uh, had an exchange on this last week or the week before. We are committed to the 2021 target. Some councils uh, already have plans in place to meet that. Other councils uh, require greater work and we are working with councils to responsibly uh, and appropriately deal with waste, which is, I, I think, what everybody would expect us to do. I'd be very happy to ask the Environment Secretary to discuss further uh, with Willie Rennie the precise uh, plans that require to be in place so that all of us can get behind and see this target met. Willie Rennie. I think she should check out the OBR report because it's all very clear within there. Uh, this government is making a bit of a habit of breaking its own laws. The SNP NHS waiting times law has been broken for 190,000 patients. The SNP class sizes law has been broken for 4,500 children. And now we find the SNP government is about to break its own law on waste. The First Minister is right to be appalled by the chaotic Conservative government over Brexit. But her smugness about the incompetence of the Conservative government cannot hide our incompetence in our own backyard. Law after law broken by this failing government. What sums up her government best? Thousands of pupils overcrowded, hundreds of thousands of patients waiting, or a million tonnes of rubbish? I can just urge, again, urge all colleagues, just try to be more respectful and not personal in their questions. First Minister. I think that ship has sailed with Willie Rennie, presiding officer, but uh, keep, keep trying. Uh, on the, the issue of, uh, of landfill, I mean, I, I would say to, to Willie Rennie, it's, it's hard to understand how we could stand here accused of breaking a law, as he puts it, that's not due to even be enforced until 2021. Uh, we are working <laughs> towards delivery of that uh, with our local authority partners. 
Uh, it's a very important objective. It's an important responsibility. It's difficult and complex, as many uh, things are. But we will continue to work with our local authority partners because it is the right thing to do. Um, in terms of waiting times in the NHS, the Health Secretary recently, of course, has published uh, the waiting times uh, reduction plan. We were investing £850 million pounds to make sure that waiting times uh, are reduced in the areas uh, where there is significant pressure. Pressure, of course, uh, coming from an ageing population and greater demand on our National Health Service. Uh, and, of course, in education, which I think he uh, also uh, mentioned, uh, we see uh, more teachers uh, in our schools now. There are more teachers in our primary schools now than at any uh, stage since I was at primary school in 1980. Uh, there are, I think, 1,200 more teachers in our school uh, since I became uh, First Minister. So we, unlike the UK government that has completely ceased to govern in yes. any meaningful sense, yes, we're getting on indeed. with the important issues in our environment, in our yeah. health service, in yeah. our education yeah. system, and that's exactly what we will continue to do. Some further supplementaries. The first from Maureen Watt, to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Maureen Thank Watt. you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the devastating floods which have hit many parts of Malawi in recent days, resulting in 45 deaths, 577 injuries, at least two missing people. 150,000 households have, effect, have been affected, or three quarters of a million of the population. Over 15,000 households have been totally destroyed, resulting in 187 camps being established throughout the country. A horrifying situation, I'm sure you will agree. Given Scotland's, this Parliament and the government's very close links with Malawi, what can the Scottish Government do to help the people of Malawi at this dreadful time? First Minister. Well, can I thank Maureen Watt for raising this issue and my condolences go to all those who have been affected by this uh, disaster in Malawi. Our thoughts are with the people of Malawi at what is an incredibly difficult time uh, for them. I am pleased to tell the Chamber today that we have uh, just announced the provision of £175,000 to support efforts to ensure safe water supplies in southern Malawi. Uh, funding will be provided through the Climate Justice Fund and delivered by our Hydro Nation partners who are of course already working on the ground in southern Malawi to secure water resources affected by the floods. Scottish Government officials will also work closely with partners on the ground to support the relief efforts. Um, Scotland, of course, as Maureen Watt uh, has alluded to, has a historic relationship with Malawi going back 150 years. Uh, they are our friends. Uh, we do a great deal of work uh, in uh, and for uh, Malawi. We benefit a lot ourselves from uh, that work with Malawi. Uh, so we stand with them at this difficult time and we'll do everything possible to help. Graeme Simpson. Following the pay deal um, with teachers, I and some other MSPs were contacted by a serving police officer from East Kilbride last week, and he wrote this, whilst I appreciate that teachers have worked hard and do deserve a pay rise, why is it that NHS staff were given 9% and police officers only 6.5%? Does the Scottish Government place the value of police officers as only half? These are the words of a serving police officer does the Scottish Government place the value of police officers as only half that of school teachers? Is it that the Government know that because police officers cannot strike or take any real industri industrial action, that they are an easy target? What would the First Minister say to that police officer and thousands of others? First Minister. Well, I think parts of uh, those comments were quite disgraceful, actually. Yeah. I value all public sector workers yeah. and I thank them yeah. for the work that they do. On, on the police pay award, uh, on the police pay award, uh, that is the best uh, award for police officers anywhere in the UK. The Scottish Police Federation uh, described it as the best pay award in 20 yeah. years. And if the member uh, thinks 6.5% uh, is not good enough, I would love to pay all of our public sector workers even more than we are. But if he thinks that's not good enough, uh, then I wonder what he makes of the 2% uh, that have been awarded to police officers in England by his Tory colleagues yeah. in the Westminster exactly. uh, government. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I think described uh, by the head of the Met as a, a punch in the nose uh, for police officers. Um, in terms of our NHS uh, workers, uh, many NHS workers, of course, uh, get higher pay in Scotland than they do in England because of the value we attach to the work that they do. Uh, and in terms of teachers, they have uh, now been offered, they were previously offered a very good pay deal. They have uh, now been offered an exceptionally good pay deal. I think that 
is a recognition of the good work that they do. I hope that is now uh, accepted. But I uh, value all public sector workers. And I think if you look at any group of public sector workers, you will find that the value attached to them by the Scottish Government is much, much greater than the value attached to their counterparts in England by the Tory Government at Westminster. Question number four, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Spring Statement. First Minister. Well, the Spring Statement underlines, again, the chaos at the heart of the UK Government. Um, it showed that the Chancellor has billions of pounds available that he could be investing in public services, but has instead had to set aside to pay for the self-inflicted mess that is Brexit. Uh, the UK Government's chaotic approach to Brexit is already undermining the economy. The OBR forecasts the UK uh, growth will slow and that in both 2018 and 2019, business investment will contract. Uh, that would represent the weakest period of business investment since the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, that, uh, quite bluntly, is the cost of the UK Government's economic mismanagement. And sadly, there's no sign that they are uh, about to change course, or at least no sign that they are voluntarily about to change course. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Would the First Minister agree with me, however, that we should welcome the Chancellor's recognition of the strategic importance of Edinburgh University and the requirement to invest in the borderlands? However, does the First Minister also share my deep disappointment that the Chancellor failed to take the opportunity to guarantee all EU funding to Scotland worth over £5 billion in the current EU budget round will be replaced in full or indeed to announce any amount of funding whatsoever, simply not good enough from this Tory UK Chancellor. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I agree with uh, Bruce Crawford's comments uh, about uh, Edinburgh University and obviously uh, also the borderlands? Uh, the Scottish Government confirmed, of course, yesterday that we will invest up to £85 million in the Borderlands growth deal over the next uh, 10 years. But it is uh, deeply disappointing that the UK Government has yet to provide any clarity on future arrangements for EU funding. Proposals in agriculture, fisheries and structural funding are vague and they provide no certainty for the future. Uh, the position on the proposed shared prosperity fund is particularly concerning, with no sign of the consultation that was promised in autumn of last year nor any meaningful engagement with the devolved administrations on this matter. It is crucial that the UK government urgently commits to replacing all funding streams in full and that we receive our fair share of this to ensure that decisions can be taken in the best interest of Scotland. Uh, funding decisions currently being made by Scottish ministers should continue to be made by Scottish ministers. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister has just said, yesterday's spring statement set out funding of £260 million from the UK Government and £85 million from the Scottish Government for the Borderlands Growth Deal, delivering a manifesto co a commitment from the Scottish Conservatives. This deal shows what can be achieved when both of Scotland's governments work together. First Minister, cross-border links with the south of Scotland and the north of England are integral and must be enhanced to promote inclusive growth. Growth. With that in mind, does she agree that an extension of the Borders Railway from Tweed Bank to Carlisle would bring transformational change to that area? First Minister. Well, I, I actually want to come on to substantively agree with the sentiments uh, of the question, but I do feel obliged to, uh, I suppose, uh, inject a bit of a clarification into the figures that were used uh, at the start of the question. Uh, the member said that the UK government had confirmed it was investing up to £260 million in the borderlands deal uh, compared to the £85 million from the Scottish government. Uh, that is true, but I think it's important to point out that of the UK government's £260 million, only £65 million of that is for uh, the Scottish uh, side. Uh, the rest of it is for oh. England. So uh, oh. it just puts us slightly... <laughs> but, oh but nevertheless, oh nevertheless... By the very nature of borderlands, it is important that the investment is on both sides. I am a long, long-standing supporter of the borderlands work and the borderlands uh, growth deal. Uh, what the member says about the borders railway, I also have a lot of sympathy with, which is why, of course, the, the government has been doing feasibility uh, work around that. So we will continue to support this initiative, uh, and I'm glad to see yesterday that the UK government is prepared to support it as well. James Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. The recent SNP Green budget uh, resulted in councils being forced to make cuts and pass them on to local communities. So we have job cuts in Dundee, the ending of support to the Citizens Advice Bureau in Clark Manninshire and the axing 
of free school bus travel uh, in Moray. Uh, can, 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 uh, can I ask the First Minister Order, please. if any Barnet consequentials are available from yesterday's spring statement, will they be allocated to local councils who have had to inflict pain on local communities? First Minister. Well, firstly, on the issue of Barnet consequentials, we have no clarity yet on whether there are any uh, Barnet consequentials uh, or what the amount of any Barnet consequentials uh, would be. And uh, when we do know that, of course, we'll share that information uh, with Parliament. Uh, James Kelly talks uh, about budget decisions. I, I have to say that I thought the decision of the Labour uh, group yesterday to vote against an increase in the carers uh, supplement was absolutely and utterly shameful. The only ones, as I understand it, uh, in the Parliament uh, that did that. More broadly on local government funding, uh, as he well knows, uh, the budget for uh, local government has increased uh, and that is a positive thing. Uh, we do not pretend that life is easy for local councils in the current climate. But if uh, James Kelly is as uh, concerned as he claims to be uh, about the budgets of local government or any other part of the public sector or about cuts or anything like that, then isn't it about time that he started to direct uh, some of that anger at the Tory government uh, who are the architects of these cuts? Um, can I remind him that the budget of the Scottish government uh, between 2010 and the end of this decade will be cut by £1.9 billion in real terms. That's the reality. And frankly, that is the consequence we're living with as a result uh, of his partnership with the Better Together Tory partners in the 2014 referendum. Question number five, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, dear Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that people are financially ready for their retirement. First Minister. Uh, matters relating to pensions, uh, unfortunately, remain reserved to the UK Government. However, we are committed to doing what we can within our current powers to ensure people are financially ready for retirement. Uh, we support the development of a labour market that offers good quality and rewarding jobs for everyone, no matter their age. We're also supporting older people through our financial health check service, which offers free advice to help older people maximise their incomes. Uh, and we do this in the face of continuing attacks from the Tory government on people reaching retirement age, yeah. such as the scandal that thousands of WASPy women yeah. are facing yeah. with delays in getting their pensions yeah. and the disgraceful cuts to pension credit for mixed age couples. So I don't know what Michelle Ballantyne's follow-up question is going to be, but let me warn her, I will take no lectures from the Tories on pensions. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, um, given that I was asking a question and not lecturing, I think that's quite a sad response. However, however, I am heartened to hear that you are trying to do things for older people who are uh, nearing retirement. But what I'm actually wanting to ask is I've found in my conversations with younger people that most have only a very basic understanding of how their pension works or how to contribute it, to it during their lives. Um, back in 2015, there was um, some action down south of actually creating teaching materials to explain financial planning to youngsters um, following uh, Steve, Minister Steve Webb's research that found teenagers had an expectation of a state pension that stretched from between £800 per week to £9 per week. So could the First Minister tell me if any steps have been taken by the Scottish Government to educate school pupils around the um, importance of their pension and learning within the curriculum? First Minister. Well, you know, it's actually a reasonable question, to, to be fair. And I, I covered in some of my original answer uh, the work we're doing to make sure that people are financially ready for retirement. And I think it is a reasonable proposition that we should also be looking at how we educate young people. Of course, this is a reserved matter, but we will take our responsibility to ensure we're contributing to it. But can I say uh, to Michelle Ballantyne, and I, I'm going to say this uh, seriously, and I would ask her to reflect on it. If we are uh, going to say that we need to educate young people more to save for their retirement, we should wonder what example it sets to young people when over 2 million women 
paid their national con yep. insurance contributions yep. Yep. in full uh, in the expectation that they would receive their state pension at a certain age only for that uh, pension entitlement to be robbed uh, from them by the UK government. Yeah. Uh, so if we want to encourage young people to save for their retirement and convince them that it's worth doing so, then we have to start treating our current pensioners with more dignity and respect than the current government in charge of pensions is doing. And I would hope that is a case Michelle Ballantyne will make forcibly to her colleagues at Westminster. Yeah. Yeah. Question number six, Neil Finlay. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government has taken following the recent meeting between the Health Secretary and MESH survivors. First Minister. Uh, last week, the Health Secretary and the Chief Medical Officer met with MESH campaigners and Neil Finlay to discuss their concerns over access to specialist services for MESH removal. Uh, as the Health Secretary set out in an answer on Friday, uh, we're listening carefully to those concerns. Uh, we've asked a group of senior medical managers to look at a range of options to see how the care and support for these women can be improved, drawing on international expertise in transvaginal mesh surgery. Uh, the group will draw on academics and other advisors as well as advocates for the women who have been affected. Uh, the first meeting of the group will be held as soon as possible and Jane Freeman has committed to writing to the campaigners within one month to set out the probable timescales for this work. Thank the uh, First Minister for that answer. At the meeting, uh, the Scottish Mesh survivors made a very emotional appeal uh, for the government to take up the offer to bring a uh, top US surgeon to Scotland to carry out pioneering mesh removal and train surgeons here. On Friday, the government issued an ambiguous press release that hinted at progress but lacked any clarity. So can I seek clear, a clear and straightforward answer on their behalf? When will Scottish mesh survivors have access to the highest global standard of mesh removal procedures? And will the Scottish Government now accept the offer from Dr Veronicus to come to Scotland to help mesh injured women here. First Minister. Well, Neil Finlay raises an important issue. Um, Jean Freeman listened carefully uh, to those uh, that she met uh, on Friday and has done since then everything that she told uh, the, the campaigners uh, that she would uh, do. Uh, specifically, as I said in my original answer, uh, she has asked a group of medical directors and senior clinical managers to look at a range of options to improve care and support, and that is the right way forward. In terms of the, the answer to the question, when uh, will there be more detail, uh, she will uh, write to campaigners within a month, setting out the next steps in this work. That is the, the proper way to take this uh, forward. In terms of removal of mesh, uh, decisions to remove mesh would be made by a patient in consultation with a clinical uh, specialist who will share all relevant information and provide support. So there is a real commitment uh, to taking forward uh, the proposals that were made on Friday, but to doing that in a proper way. And I hope we will have Neil Finlay's support uh, as we do so. Question number seven, John Finney. Deciding officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to the reported increasing number of drugs deaths. First Minister. Our National Alcohol and Drug Strategy, uh, which was published last November, set out a range of measures to prevent <coughs> drug-related harm. The strategy's focus is on improving how we support those who need it and treat the wider issues affecting them. It outlines how we will work with and fund partners to strengthen links between traditional addiction services and initiatives in housing, mental health and the third sector. Uh, this is backed with an additional £20 million a year for drug and alcohol services. Uh, the investment has been allocated to support new approaches that respond to the needs of those who are most at risk in a more joined up and person-centred way. John Finney. Okay, thank you, President Officer. I thank the First Minister for that approach, uh, for that response. Uh, the current approach clearly isn't working, First Minister. There were 934 deaths and 217, and sadly, everything suggests the figure for 2018 may be significantly higher. Uh, First Minister, we're faced with a, a public health crisis. Scottish ministers have the power to establish a public inquiry into any matter when there is a large loss of life and or serious health and safety issues. And this situation clearly meets both these criteria. Will the First Minister urgently establish a statutory inquiry into Scotland's drug death crisis and commit to acting on its findings in order to ending this ongoing tragedy? First Minister. I absolutely agree with the, the seriousness of, of this issue. I, I'm not immediately persuaded that would be the best way forward but of course we will consider any proposal uh, that has been made uh, any death from drugs is one 
too many. Uh, of course, many of uh, the, the people we sadly see dying from drugs are people who have lived with alcohol and drug use for a long time and become more vulnerable as they grow older. Uh, the 2018 drug death report showed fewer deaths in under 25s than in the previous year. And of course, recent reports also highlight falling heroin use, particularly in the under 25 age group. So there's absolutely no room there for complacency, but I think it is an important contextual point to make. We want to look at different ways uh, of addressing these issues. That's why, for example, we have supported uh, Glasgow City Council in its request to set up medically supervised uh, safer drug consumption facilities. We want to uh, treat these issues much uh, more as public health issues, uh, bringing different agencies together. And as we do that, we are, of course, prepared to consider any proposal that is made. Um, and I will uh, do that with the one that John Finney has made today. Thank you. That brings us to an end of First Minister's questions. Could you say to colleagues that, despite making good progress in the last couple of weeks, the questions and the answers were too long this afternoon. So can we please revisit this? Otherwise, I will have to cut off members. Uh, that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move... <laughs> Rather unfortunate pun, I think. Exactly, yes. Typical for the press to pick up on that. OK, we're going to move to members' business. Members' business, thank you very much, Ms Cunningham. In the name of Lee MacArthur. Uh, but before we do, we're going to have...